I'm Maureen Fiedler, and this is Interfaith Voices. Prince was known as a quiet person with an audacious talent for writing songs and performing them. But he may also have been the world's most famous Jehovah's Witness. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. With his death on April 21st at 57 years of age, we're hearing more and more about how his faith influenced his music and his worldview. The afterworld. A world of never ending happiness. You can always see the sun. Why didn't Prince vote or celebrate birthdays? We wanted to learn more about what Jehovah's Witnesses believe and why. And so we've invited Joel and Gardio to the show. He was raised as a Jehovah's Witness himself, although he never formally joined the faith. He is also an award-winning blogger and the director of a PBS documentary about Jehovah's Witnesses. It's called Knocking, and he joins us from San Francisco. Joel, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. Now, Joel, what do we know about Prince as a Jehovah's Witness? Well, most Jehovah's Witnesses probably didn't themselves know that Prince was a witness. Um, There aren't a lot of celebrities within the Jehovah's Witness faith that are celebrated as celebrities. So if Prince was in his local congregation in Minnesota, people certainly would have known about it, but he would have kept it quiet. Jehovah's Witnesses like to stay low-key. Now, let's look at the faith. I think most people hear Jehovah's Witnesses, and they immediately think of that Watchtower newsletter and knocking on doors— You went door-knocking with your mother as a small boy. What was it like? Did a lot of people sort of slam the door in your face? So I'd like to say, you know, today I have a pretty thick skin. I'm actually running for local office for city council in San Francisco. So ironic that I'm door-knocking a lot right now. And it prepared me for it because uh, when you're a small boy and you knock on doors, yes, you get a lot of people slamming the door in your face because... People don't like to hear about religion, let alone an unpopular religion. And so it, it was my norm as a child, but it was it was very interesting because it gave me an insight into a lot of different worldviews, those people who did answer the door and talk to my mother. It allowed me to see how these two adults with very different viewpoints could discuss and negotiate very um, sometimes hot-button issues. So it, it was a great learning lesson from a young age. I can imagine. How often, roughly, percentage-wise, would you find somebody answering the door being willing to talk to your mother or yourself? Well, it would depend on the neighborhood uh, where we went knocking. We didn't discriminate. We went to all different neighborhoods uh, within our city. I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan, which is a General Motors factory town uh, not far from Flint, which is in the news. And so Saginaw is kind of a smaller version of Flint. And so we would go to some down-and-out neighborhoods. And it was interesting because... In the wealthier neighborhoods, less people opened the door. In the uh, more poor neighborhoods, more people did open the door and were, and were willing to talk. You know, the large tenet of Jehovah's Witness is that life will be better, that there will be a paradise on earth, there won't be sickness, there won't be these divisions of, of nation. And so, you know, those messages resonate more in an area where people don't feel safe and secure in those mm-hmm. areas. So let's talk about why Jehovah's Witnesses go door knocking. Well, the biblical reason is they follow Jesus in the book of Matthew, where he says, go out and be my disciples and spread this good news around the world. So they're following that example. But when you door knock, you know, I'm trying to think of anyone that my mother ever converted. I don't think she did convert anybody, but she continues to knock to this day. and She's been knocking for 40 years. You know, it's not so much that they're trying to rack up a certain number of brownie points to retain some reward. Um, I think it's just part of the mission of wanting to share what they believe and let others know that this uh, so-called new world is coming. I understand that somehow this door knocking is tied up with the concept of the afterlife. How do Jehovah's Witnesses see the afterlife? Well, that's a very complicated question because... The majority of people think of afterlife as heaven, and people tend to want to apply that standard to Jehovah's Witnesses. And so for the average Jehovah's Witness, they they don't aspire to go to heaven. For them, the goal is a life on earth, a paradise earth. You know, the best analogy would be the John Lennon song, Imagine. No heaven 
above us, no hell below, uh, nothing to die or fight for. So the concept is that the world will have no political boundaries, everyone will live in peace and harmony, and people will literally live forever uh, with no sickness or mm. death. And so it's a paradise on earth that the witnesses aspire uh, toward. Mm. And so they're not looking at some eternal heaven to which you would go after you die. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses believe like if you die, you pretty much cease to exist. You do not go anywhere. It's a deep sleep, they describe it as. You're not conscious of anything until what they call the resurrection, which would be when this earthly paradise happens, then those who have died in the past would be resurrected into it. Uh, but they would never have, would have gone in the meantime to a heaven or anywhere else. Jehovah's Witnesses for the last hundred and so years have been saying there is no hell and heaven is not what you think it is. Now, let's look at some of the practices that most people who are not Jehovah's Witnesses consider unusual. For example, they won't accept blood transfusions. Why is that? Well, that just goes to a scripture in the Bible, I think Leviticus, that talked about not to eat blood or ingest blood. So they take that literal to even a transfusion. Um, The blood issue is something They've held for many, many decades, and many times, you know, court orders were forcing blood on adult witnesses. So it actually raised a lot of interesting issues about patient rights. Uh, Later, when um, the AIDS crisis broke out, it was interesting because the scientific and medical community now had a reason to look at blood in a different way and find alternatives. And the Jehovah's Witnesses had the same motivation Uh, So they work together with the medical and scientific community, but for different reasons. So the witnesses said, hey, now you have a reason to find new alternatives for blood. We don't want blood. We'll work with you. And so now you have these medical centers that now advertise bloodless surgery to the general public as something that's um, uh, desirable. So Mm. to me, that's a really fascinating uh, intersection of science and religion. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Christmas, Easter, or birthdays. And we have a clip of Prince talking about this. You you had how many birthdays? Me? What do you think? Well, I know that you had one birthday. Yeah. You were born on a certain day. You had no more birthdays after that. So I don't celebrate birthdays, so that stops me from counting days, which stops me from counting time, which allows me to still look the same as I did 10 years ago, (laughs) just like that lady did. That's great. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I love that, too. What What is the Jehovah's Witness explanation for not observing birthdays? Well, the not observing birthdays and Christmas go hand in hand. So they'll look back in the Bible and they'll claim, you know, we don't see birthdays mentioned much in the Bible. We certainly don't see a record of Jesus celebrating his birthday. But we do see two bad men celebrating birthdays. We see King Herod, who you know, was trying to kill Jesus and had John the baptizer beheaded at a birthday. And then they see the Pharaoh of Egypt who enslaved the Israelites. So they see, well, two bad guys who had birthdays, maybe we shouldn't follow them. So that's that's kind of the line on birthdays. Now, as far as Christmas goes, well, that's a birthday of Jesus, so therefore they wouldn't celebrate it. But it's also laced with all of the, um, you know, it used to be December 25th isn't really when Jesus was born. You know, he was probably born in the autumn, historians would say. And so it's December is wrapped up with some pagan uh, winter solstice. There's the tree, there's Santa Claus, all the commercialism that goes with it. So they would say Jesus would actually find this blasphemous. So therefore, mm-hmm. they, that's why they stay away from Christmas. The one thing they do celebrate, because I, I think it was in the book of Matthew, where Jesus said, celebrate my death. So they do. So every year, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses get together and memorialize Jesus' death. So that is actually something they celebrate. Now, most people probably aren't aware that Jehovah's Witnesses were among the earliest defenders of First Amendment protections. And this is rooted in their objection to saluting the flag during the Pledge of Allegiance. What was their objection to saluting the flag? They stay out of all politics, from voting to military service. And so the the saluting the flag or pledging allegiance to the flag, they say only God deserves our allegiance. We're not going to mm-hmm. pledge to a man-made country because a country is artificial. And in the United States here, this case went all the way to the Supreme Court, I believe, because right. someone didn't pledge allegiance to the flag in school. Yeah, well, what happened was you had, in 1940, the schoolgirl refused to pledge allegiance in school. She was expelled from public school. 
And then parents would be fired from their jobs if they wouldn't salute the flag at work. So they went to the Supreme Court, asked, does a free society, should it force citizens to do a patriotic salute? And the Supreme Court said, yes, we, we do, eight to one. And so then this became open season on Jehovah's Witnesses because they refused to comply. And now mobs went after them. It's, it's recorded in uh, 42 states. People burned down their houses of worship. You know, they were beaten up as they mm-hmm. knocked door to door. Uh, and now you have to imagine World War II has started. And so the liberal elite on the East Coast, led by, you know, um, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, questioned this and said, hey, why are these mobs attacking Jehovah's Witnesses in the U.S. and we're fighting against forced nationalism in Germany? And so the Supreme Court, three years later, revisited the case and reversed itself, which is unheard of. And now, if you fast forward some 70 years, you've got same-sex marriage in the in the U.S. and state of California. And one of the cases cited as to why we cannot deny people the fundamental freedom of marriage was the 1943 Jehovah's Witness case. The reason was, in the earlier 40, 1940 case, the, the rationale for discriminating against witnesses by the Supreme Court. They said, you know, the witnesses can always go to the ballot box and ask their fellow countrymen to uh, vote in their favor. They always have that. Well, in 43, the Supreme Court said, no, there are some rights so fundamental, you can't put them to a vote because the minority will always be trampled by the majority. Well, 70 years later, that happened in California. The majority trampled the rights of gays and lesbians uh, and said they couldn't marry. And so here, in this great irony, the Jehovah's Witness case actually helped gays and lesbians marry 70 years later. Jehovah's Witnesses don't sanction gay marriage. So the beauty of the U.S. Constitution, that's the way I see it. That's really an irony. That's right. Now, all this somehow fits together, I think, perhaps with their refusal of military service, which I understand they don't do, and they also right. don't vote. That's right. Now, you know, they may like a certain politician— I mean, they don't think all politicians are evil incarnate. They they acknowledge some politicians are really good on human rights and really are helpful. Uh, but ultimately, they're not going to vote for that person because they believe that this new world order is coming soon that's going to make all of that irrelevant. Uh, you're not a Jehovah's Witness. Your mother is. Do witnesses shun family members who don't have the same belief system? Among Jehovah's Witness families, there's a a wide range of how family members interact with each other who are non-believers. So, yes, they do shun, and I think it's a very unhealthy thing. Um, But the distinction is they only shun people who made a conscious decision to become a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I never became a Jehovah's Witness, so my mother really had nothing to shun. Uh, All she could do is express her disapproval that I'd didn't become one or her disapproval. That I, I see. I'm in, a, I'm in a same-sex marriage, but, you know, there's nothing for her to shun, per se. Now, others who maybe they joined the faith and then decided later it wasn't for them, they've got a much more complicated road. And, and you know, and the other thing, you know, I'm gay, I, and I got married a, a year ago, uh, and my mother um, did not come to my wedding because on the principle, she didn't want to, to be a part of that, you know, ceremony. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, I'm actually... She's coming to San Francisco to visit me and my husband in a couple of weeks. So we do, uh, you know, have a relationship. And do they have weekly worship services, Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah, they do. They, uh, their churches are called Kingdom Halls. Um, the Kingdom Hall looks like a mysterious place from the outside. They, you know, to keep construction costs down or keep them simple to build, they often don't have windows or they don't look too ornate. Um, but on the inside, they're pretty much boring looking classrooms with fluorescent lights and people are just sitting in rows and and listening to a speaker give a lecture is there singing yeah they sing a song to open and close the uh the service but it's certainly no no holy rollers or uh, tambourines uh-huh. or anything like that i mean believe me as a kid i sat through countless they call them meetings countless meetings and i was bored to death there there's there's not much excitement at a jehovah's witness kingdom hall uh now, some people consider Jehovah's Witnesses a cult. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I don't see it. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of things you can say that, you, you know, you can disagree with Jehovah's Witnesses on. But number one, there's no magnanimous leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, there's no forced tithing. The, the, they're not fleecing people down for lots of money. You know, it's mm-hmm. all, you know, people donate. It's all voluntary. So I just don't see it rise to the level of, of cult definition. 
Joel Angardio is the director of the documentary about Jehovah's Witnesses called Knocking. And thanks so much for joining us today, Joel. Thank you. It was a great conversation. You can find a link to Knocking on our website, interfaithradio.org. We requested an interview with a representative from Jehovah's Witnesses, which they respectfully declined.